So in the next few videos, I would like to talk a bit about rule languages. Uh, rule languages are um, formalisms in computer science, which where we write rules, if then statements, so to speak, in order to extract information from a given data source, in order to query a database or in order to analyze some resource. And um, there are many such rule languages around. Uh, many uh, different technical approaches have been found, but uh, overall they have some very similar uh, foundations. And I would like to focus mostly on those foundations without going too much into specific technicalities. And um, without doubt, I think the most simple foundation that you could uh, think of um, for any rule language is what is called data log. Data log um, is the name of a very simple rule language that I'm going to explain to you in this video and in the next few videos, um, mostly using abstract uh, high level uh, descriptions, but in the end also with some um, uh, technical details of uh, for systems on how to that actually use these so that we can again have exercises where you also can um, get your hands on some of these rules and try to do things with them in uh with real data yes <clears throat> okay so this is always our goal of course in this uh, course that uh, on the one hand i'm talking abstract theoretical things here but at the same time we have exercises where you have hands-on sessions uh, that uh, allow you to actually try this out and to develop some specific skills uh, that uh, enable you to do data manipulation and analysis Okay, so um, welcome back. My name is Markus Krösch and these are still the videos on the Knowledge Graph course here at TU Dresden. Right, so um, I don't want to give a whole long lecture on data log and rules. There could be much more uh, about this, but rather I would like to do this quick and uh, not too dirty, I hope, uh, <clears throat> by uh, starting off with an example. So what you see here is a set of rules and you say well rules where are the rules here i see five lines well each of these lines is lines is a rule um which you read from the right to the left so this little symbol here in the middle the colon minus is how we often write the implication symbol in such rule languages so you should think of this as an arrow that points from the right to the left meaning that the Precondition for this rule is farther x, y. So we are looking for situations where we find some farther x of some other thing y. And we would like to infer uh, that uh, this is uh, actually a parent relationship. <clears throat> now, what I just said is not actually what I intend here. So it's not x is the father, but y is the father. And we can already see that when naming properties, sometimes it makes sense to be a bit more descriptive. Maybe I should um, have called this has father in order to distinguish uh, from father of, which would be the opposite relationship. <clears throat> okay, um, so this rule should only tell us that a father relationship is a special type of parent relationship. The second rule states the same for mother. Mothers are parents. So if X has the mother Y, then X has the parent Y. No? And this is the notation I use here. So these rules are very simple. They only have one premise and give you one conclusion. The next rule is of the same form. If X has the parent Y, then X has the ancestor Y. So parents are also ancestors. And this, of course, will apply to both fathers and mothers. And now comes some uh, more interesting case, because we now say that if X has a parent Y and Y has the ancestor set, then X has the ancestor set. So you immediately can recognize this as a simple form of transitivity of the ancestor relationship, <clears throat> where we uh, combine further parent relationships from the left in this case with the already computed ancestor relationship to get more ancestors. Yeah. And this rule, of course, if you look at it, is obviously recursive. So um, the relationships we have already found for ancestor are used to produce more relationships for ancestor. Well, and finally, here is an actual query. I would like to know all the ancestors of Alice. And for this, I write ancestor of Alice Y uh, implies Resart Y. 
So the, re so the y's that appear in this result um, predicate in facts of the form result uh, of y are exactly those which are an ancestor of Alice based on this recursively computed ancestor relationship, which is based in turn on parent and thereby on father and mother. Okay, so this is how, how this would work. Um, recursive uh, rules. And I hope that um, besides the little um, uh, change in syntax from the from a, an arrow that you know from logic maybe to this colon minus, this is actually very easy to understand for. Um, computer scientists, because in computer science, when we program, we all the time are handling if then rules. So the idea at, uh, of having a certain condition that can become active and can apply to some situation and a certain conclusion of things that then happen if in this situation is uh, relatively near to our day to day thinking when we program. What is um, special here or what is, of course, notable here in uh, is that the expressions that we are acting on are logical expressions. So th things like father x, y um, are um, statements in predicate logic <clears throat> that I hope you have heard about before in your undergraduate studies uh, as a formalism to describe uh, certain um, relationships between objects. Uh, and uh, the comma here, in this case, of course, I should also maybe mention, is essentially the logical conjunction, the end. Yeah, so we want things, we want to find x, y, and z such that x has parent y and y has ancestor z. So the comma becomes the end, the colon minus becomes the arrow from right to left. That's it. Okay. As we will see, I will discuss that a bit uh, in a few slides in more detail. Uh, this is also not hard to apply to graphs. Here I have applied it to uh, predicate logic facts, mother, uh, father facts uh, that we may have about some uh, people in our database. And then I have uh, derived recursively uh, some results that I would like to maybe query. Okay, now before moving on with, with further examples, let me become uh, slightly more uh, formal in the sense that I would like at least to make you acquainted with a bit of notation and a bit of notions that uh, we often use, terminology that we often use when we talk about rules. Um, so here I have a slide about data log syntax. Um, <clears throat> actually, the syntax of data log can mostly be derived from the syntax of first order predicate logic that, as I said, you should have uh, heard about in another course already. So um, what we deal with, there are different types of elements. On the one hand, we would like to work with constants. Constants are sp denoting specific things like Alice in my example, or maybe an IRI or a data type literal in RDF could also be conceived as a constant. Then we have variables like x, y, and z in my example. Variables are placeholders for arbitrary things. Um, and we have predicate symbols such as mother, father, parent that we use to describe relationships between constants or variables in some cases. We also sometimes speak of terms. A term is nothing else than a constant or a variable. So if we want to talk about the things that can appear inside a, um, a predicate, uh, for example, here in father x, y or ancestor Alice y, these are terms and they can be either constants like Alice or variables like y. Yeah. And um, if we put all of this together, so if we take a predicate symbol and we um, give it a number of parameters in parentheses, then the result of this is what we call an atom. It is called an atom because it's the smallest unit of uh, information that you can have in such a logical language. Uh, there's, uh, it has pieces, of course, but the pieces themselves are not logical formulae anymore. They don't express anything. They are just standalone terms. Um, the smallest thing that expresses some meaning is an atom. Yeah? For example, if I say uh, that uh, somebody's mother is, is somebody, then this is a statement which I make about two constants, maybe in combination with the predicate mother. Okay, 
In order to form atoms, usually we should know how many parameters an atom requires since this uh, is known as the arity of a predicate. So normally we expect that predicates have a certain arity which should be the same across all users of that predicate. So ancestor here, for example, is a binary predicate. It has arity 2. Result is a unary predicate. It has arity 1. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, hopefully all rather... Um, Unex uh, unsurprising to you and, and as a standard thing that you already have heard elsewhere. Now, data log rules are defined in a slightly uh, different syntax than you would normally have it for, for logic, but uh, the changes are very easy to remember. So I already showed this to you. A, f a data log rule essentially is an expression of this form where you have atoms on the right-hand side separated by commas. There can be more than one, if you like. Then there's this special symbol here in the middle, and then there's an atom on the left. Um, <clears throat> so all of these are atoms. They can contain variables or they can contain constants. Both is allowed. Um, H here is usually called the head or the conclusion of the rule because it's what we conclude when we apply the rule. Um, the conjunction B1 to Bm I, I told you that the commas are read as an end, so it's a conjunction. So this conjunction is called the body or the premise of the rule. Uh, this is what has to hold in order for the rule to become applicable. Okay, so this is the basic structure of rules. Um, we often want to look at rules that, um, or we sometimes look at rules which uh, are specified, which are instantiated to uh, apply it to specific constants where we, for example, replace the variables with constants. And uh, if we have such a rule without any variables, this is called a ground rule. Ground in general is an adjective in formal logic and it refers to things without variables. So ground rule is a rule without variables. In our case, meaning that all the terms are constants. If you have had some uh, general predicate first order logic courses in your undergraduates, you will have uh, maybe learned about other forms of terms, which I don't mention here. For example, in predicate logic, you usually also have function symbols. Um, this is not something we really need for data log, so I'm going to completely omit this in my uh, video. So a ground rule can only contain constants. That's the only other term that there is besides the variables. Um, and if there's an empty body, so if there is not even B1, but no Bs at all, it just says head follows, then this is equivalent to saying head is true without any preconditions. And in this case, we call this a fact, which should be intuitive. So if you have a, a, a statement which says without any precondition, this relationship between these constants holds, as it's just a fact that you are stating. <clears throat> okay, sets of rules like this are often called data log programs. Sometimes they are also called rule sets or some other name, but program is pretty common in the data log lit literature. And a data log query then, if we want to query a database with this, is a data log program together with a distinguished query predicate. Let's look at our example again. Why is that, uh, why do we need a distinguished query predicate? Well, because if you want to use these five rules as a query, you wouldn't know what the query result is supposed to be. Um, you have to say that the result is actually the um, set of one tuples that you can infer to be contained in the predicate result. Yeah. So, of course, in this case, I suggestively called uh, this predicate result, so it's already clear what I want here. But, of course, I could also have um, been interested in ancestor or in parent or in any other predicate that is derived here with these rules. And uh, in order to make it really a query um, with uh, specific results, we have to state which um, predicate we are interested in, and this is the additional thing that we need for a data log query. <clears throat> okay, so this is the terminology around data log, variables, constants, predicates, arities, atoms, terms. Uh, so if you remember what these things mean, at uh, if the first look, it might be a lot of uh, different names for things, um, but it's, it's worthwhile uh, remembering what is what and not to get confused with this um, because this is really uh, all there is. There are not many more terms we need to know or maybe many more notions, I should say, not to confuse that with the actual term. Um, and uh, it will help you greatly in understanding what I'm talking about if you remember what these are. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is the 
um, outline of how data log looks and how it works. One example and one formal definition. Now let me talk a bit about what it actually means. So um, uh, intuitively, of course, we have already some kind of idea what um, such a rule, how such a rule works. There is a premise and there's a conclusion. So the idea is if the premise matches a certain pattern, then the corresponding conclusion will be derived and it will be added to the knowledge that we have. And this can be happen happening recursively until we are um, satisfied or are done. But of course, we also, when we are talking about knowledge graphs, we would like to apply such rules to databases, to information collections, which are given to us, to a graph maybe, or maybe also to a relational database. And um, we have to specify how that can work because uh, databases as such don't immediately look like um, logical facts, uh, for example, that you could apply such a rule to. So how do we get from a database to a set of facts. And it turns out that this, of course, is relatively easy um, <clears throat> because databases already can be viewed as collections of facts. For example, in this case, I have a little table here. Think relational databases, maybe. So this could be a database table for mother. And it has three lines, Alice, Barbara, Barbara, Christine, and Dave, Emmy. So these are three different, <coughs> um, different uh, entries in this table which is called mother. And uh, so this data I could consider as facts in the logical sense by saying there are, th there are three facts here. The facts are mother Alice Barbara, mother Barbara Christine, and mother Dave Emmy. So each line becomes one fact of the corresponding RT. Two columns means two parameters and using the predicate name, which is the name of the table. <clears throat> so in this sense, you can always consider every database table as a set of facts and on those sets of facts you could directly use rules. Yeah. So what we see here is that data log as a language is really very closely related to relational databases and indeed people have studied this first as a relational database query language. So this is um, shouldn't be too, too surprising. This is where this comes from. Okay now what is the meaning of these rules? Well, I already described intuitively that we would like to apply the rules to derive new information. And this is actually what implications, so the normal, normally written with the arrows, of course, in logic mean. Yeah? So if you have an implication in logic, it's a formula which states that if a certain premise is true, then a certain conclusion also has to be true. And <clears throat> this is how we can read data log queries. And we can say that the result of a data log query, and the query I write now as the program plus the result predicate. Yeah? So this is the query here is a pair of a program and a sp specific distinguished predicate. This is what I just said on the previous slide. So the result of such a data log query over a given database D is the set of all facts over result that are logically entailed by the union of all the facts in the database and the program, where we read data log rules as first order logic implications from right to left. So we just think of this as an arrow in the middle of pointing from the body to the head. And this will then be a normal implication. And what follows logically from the database, read as a set of facts together with these implications, is exactly what you want to have as a result. Now, when you describe it like this, clearly there is no multiplicity. So this is a purely set-based semantics. It's not like in Sparkle where some results can happen more than once, because if you are in first-order logic, uh, a logical conclusion either follows or doesn't follow. It can't follow twice. No. So in this sense, if I derive it, if I define it like this, um, I don't have multiplicities in the definition. Um, I also don't have a real algorithm. So this is not about applying rules here. When I write uh, this definition, uh, let's have a look again. It just says um, things that are logically entailed, that are logical consequences of this theory are the results. Um, so how you compute this is not specified here and it could be in many different ways. So this is more of a high level definition, a very abstract declarative definition, which specifies what the result should be, um, provided that you know about first order logic, I should also say. So it's, it's somehow 
uh, giving a very high level description. And we would maybe like to make this a bit more concrete to have a, a more um, computational understanding also of the data log queries. So this is what I would like to do next. So this first high level definition works well. And indeed, if you know first order logic, you are you can safely for this lecture certainly read all of the data logs that we are dealing with, um, with as a first order logic implication. In general, if you want to study data log in more depth, this reading has its limits. So maybe you want then to look at it uh, in, in higher order terms, for example, but uh, for determining the results, first order logic entailment is perfectly fine for us. But I would like to offer you a second uh, semantic definition that uh, is a bit more computational now. And to get there, we want to uh, provide or we want to develop a, an idea of what it means to apply a rule, to apply a rule to produce new consequences. And <clears throat> in order to do that, we um, need first to understand what it means to instantiate a rule, meaning that you have to somehow replace the variables with something specific. You can't apply the rule to variables. You have to, the variables are just placeholders for some concrete constants and uh, so in order to use the rule to a specific list of constants you will have to instantiate the rule by substituting the variables with constants and this is done by a function which is usually called a substitution or here a ground substitution um, because it is a mapping from variables to constants <clears throat> Ground again mean again here means that what it produces doesn't have variables anymore. So it will replace all the variables by constants and not by other variables, for example. Okay, so I call this sigma here because that's oh, one of the letters that are often used for these sigma, theta, typical letters for substitutions in logic. Um, and uh, how does that work? It's a very simple process. If you have an atom A, you can write A sigma to denote the atoms that you get by simultaneously replacing all the variables x in A by sigma of x. Of course, all the variables x by sigma of x, all the variables y by sigma of y, and so on. So x is just a placeholder here. So every variable is replaced by its image under the substitution. That's what you do. And by this, you obtain from the atom which may contain variables an atom which has no longer any variables and just contains constants. So that's a grounding of this atom, we could say, using a ground substitution. Okay, so one more notion uh, that I introduce here. And with this, then we can instantiate rules and apply them to specific constants. By replacing the variables with specific values, we can see if for these replacements, the um, uh, body of the rule is actually true. And if so, then we make sure the head is also true. And this is given here in this definition where we talk about what is called the immediate consequence operator TP. Um, this again is a notion that dates back many decades and comes originally from logic programming. Um, <clears throat> if you know about Prolog, you will need see many similarities here. Um, and this uh, notation also comes from this time. I think T is maybe for truth because we want to compute what is true under the program P. P here is the actual program that we deal with. Yeah? So the set of rules that we would like to process. Okay, so what does this immediate consequence operator do? It takes a set of ground facts I to a set of ground facts TP of I. So you, you apply it to a set of facts and it gives you a new set of facts. How is this new set computed? This is what is given here. The new set TPI is the set of all the facts that have the form H sigma. So you have a ground substitution here again, um, which you apply to an atom H. And what you get, you take the set of. Uh, which H sigma should you put here? Well, you should put all the H sigma for which you have a rule that has the head H in your program with body B1 to Bn. And for which it is the case that all of the body atoms, if you instantiate them with sigma, are in the fact in the set of facts i that you are based on, that you work with. So intuitively speaking, the set of facts i describes the set of facts that you think is true, that you think are true. And if you find that for some substitution, for some way of replacing the variables in the body, all of the body atoms are also true in this set i, then the head should also be true. 
So you put the head into the set. Okay. So if you don't uh, completely understand this uh, write up, um, take your time, look at this slide for a bit longer and, and uh, pass this thoroughly so you can actually follow this notation. I find that um, some students find that very easy and some students have still even in this kind of master level course uh, significant problems using the standard set builder notation from mathematics and in understanding these kind of um, basic principles. It all depends on what kind of undergraduate courses you have heard and how uh, thorough your computer science education has been or mathematics education has been at up to this point. Okay, so I hope still this is mostly simple and intuitive for you. So we take all the conclusions that you can derive from the things that we knew before. <clears throat> Not that the things that are given to us in I are not necessarily in TPI. So it's not certain that everything which we believe in based on I is also derived by some rule. If there's no rule in the program, for example, then nothing can be derived no matter what I contains. So it's not true that I will automatically be reproduced in this application. However, we can still <clears throat> come to uh, or apply rules in a way which will ensure that we will get more and more results over time. And this way is stated here. Based on a database D, we can define a sequence of databases, which I write with D to the power of I as follows. So D1 of P is simply D. That's what we start with. So that's the first step in our sequence. We um, simply um, takes the data that we are given. By the way, I should maybe have written di of p here if I use the p everywhere else. Huh? Okay, <clears throat> so d1 of p is just d. And then if we go one step further to make the one into a two, for, we get to di plus one of p. And this is formed by taking the union of d with the tp operator applied to di of p. So we take all the things that we have derived in the previous step and we apply the consequence operator to it, get it getting new consequences. And we take also the facts that we are given from the database because they cannot be derived from rules, but we always should keep them in because they are certainly true. And so this is how we make a new step. And so recursively in every step, we take what we have previously computed and uh, obtain new consequences from it. So this is the iterative computation that I was talking about earlier. We just apply rules step by step. Each step gives us more conclusions. <clears throat> and then the limit of this process I can write as dp infinity. This is just the union of all the dpi. And this sounds a bit abstract or looks a bit abstract because it's an infinite union, right? You, you take the union over all dpi. And I must say, um, as a student, I at some point when I first saw this, probably found this confusing because I thought, why are we doing this even? If you understood this properly, you will have understood that um, the DPIs are getting bigger and bigger every step. So everything that is in DP1 is also in DP2. Everything that is in DP2 will also be in DP3 because we can always rederive what we have been deriving before because everything which is in DPI is already something we derive by applying a rule. The same rule will be able to derive it again and again whenever we apply TPI. And D we also keep. So these things are monotonically growing. And uh, so it's maybe a bit confusing why we take a union here because in the end it's clear that the largest of these will contain everything else. And uh, well, the reason simply is for this union is that we don't know how long this has to go on. Yeah, so we cannot simply write, take the biggest I for which nothing, uh, everything has been concluded. And this is DP infinity because we don't know immediately how long you have to continue this iterative computation to compute everything. And this is the reason why we write this infinite union where in practice it really isn't infinite because with data log rules after a finite number of replications of the rules everything that is derivable will always have been derived and uh, the computation can stop so in reality the computation is not infinite i just use the infinity here because i'm not sure how long it has to run until it stops yeah okay so this is what we um do here 
So here, let's again see the, oper the observations we can make. And I hope that uh, you already got them from my explanation. So first of all, this sequence of DPI is increasing. You get more and more facts. Think about it, why? Uh, maybe try to prove it, give a little argument. Um, <clears throat> a ground atom A is entailed by this a union of the database and the program if and only if A is derived eventually in this limit. So this is a very important property. Um, <clears throat> it uh, relates the first order meaning that I just gave you before, which says that something is entailed in first order logic to this computational approach. Yeah? It says if we compute it, it's derived. And if it's derived, we compute it, which explains why this is a good uh, method to compute things. Um, only a finite number of ground facts can ever be derived. Why is that? Well, because there is only a finite number of ground facts based on the constants that occur in the database. In data log, you will never um, introduce constants that are not in the database in your derivations. So, um, because it is um, typically, uh, and I should maybe have said that because I didn't, it is typically assumed that uh, all the rules uh, use the um, variables in uh, the body in the head. So there is no head variable that occurs only in the head and not in the body. So everything you will ever derive a new fact about is something that you already had some knowledge about. And since there's only finitely many things you have knowledge about in the finite database you start with, you will only derive facts about finitely many things. Yeah? And uh, there's only a limited amount of facts that can be true about finitely many things. Even if everything would be true, which is not quite likely, but it okay, could happen, then uh, even this is finite. Yeah? So at some point, uh, the derivation has to stop because there's everything that is derivable will have been derived. Yeah? So this is what the last bullet point says. The sequence D1, D2, and so on is finite, and there must be some finite k <coughs> greater or equal to 1 such that dk of p is actually equal to dp, d infinity of p. Yeah. So this is what I said earlier. The infinity is just a, a lazy way of saying we don't know how long we have to do this, but in the end it will be finite. Right, so this is how this is uh, specified and um, uh, this was a formal definition of the um, of the uh, com bottom up computations that people usually implement when they uh, work with data log. So we apply rules and apply them again to the result until eventually we don't get anything new. And this is also the intuitive um, view that, it, that you can have as a user when you want to write up rules. If you think of them in this way, it's usually a good starting point to um, specify the right rules. Okay. Now, um, this is the knowledge graphs lecture, so we would like to apply data log to graphs. So far, I've only been talking about databases in general. So how could we apply this to graphs in particular? <clears throat> well, you already know, don't you? So uh, the uh, idea, of course, is that every graph can also be viewed as a database, as a specific form of database, and then you can use it in the way uh, that data log is used on databases. Um, of course, there are different ways of how to encode graphs, let's say RDF graphs, in um, relational database or in relational structures uh, using facts of predicate logic, maybe. Um, and uh, two options, I guess, come to mind. The first option is to view properties as binary predicates. So this is close to my initial example where I had a pred predicate father and mother and ancestor. We could directly think of this as being encoded in RDF by a property called father or a property called mother. And if we want to make this translation, it would mean that a, an RDF triple SPO would be represented by a fact P of S comma O. It's very intuitive. P describes the relationship that holds between S and O. And we could write it like this. Um, if we do this, both predicate names and constants should be IRIs if we have um, uh, uh, RDF syntax as the basis here. Um, but uh, it has a bit of a disadvantage because in this case, data log will not see a relationship between the properties, 
which are predicates in our case, and the IRIs that occur in subject and object positions. So remember in RDF, there was not a real uh, difference between the IRIs you could have in the predicate and the IRIs you could be have in a subject or object. And in particular, you could dis use triples to describe a certain predicate. You could say something about the father relation or about the mother relation. But if you encode it like this, you make some very different objects. The predicate here is a first order predicate. The subject is a constant and these a constant and a predicate are different things. Even if you would use the same IRI for S and P, they would still be of a very different type in formal logic and there would be no way to um, write a rule that uh, somehow um, finds matching pairs where the predicate is the same as the subject in another fact, for example. Yeah, so these would be distinct. For many applications, though, this will be okay and uh, it's uh, an efficient and also intuitive way to encode an RDF graph because you will end up with a lot of facts that have intuitive meaning. Yeah? So father, mother, and so on. It's different types of relations for different types of relationships um, is uh, what you may also do if you want to create a new relational database. On the other hand, if you want to preserve this general nature of uh, uh, triples where the predicate is also just another resource. Then you could also do this by representing an RDF triple with a ternary predicate. So you make a new triple predicate here. I call it triple. Could have any name. It doesn't matter. And this has three arguments and the arguments are just SPO. So you just put every triple into one fact. Effectively meaning that you have a database which has one huge table called triple with three columns where all the triples are stored. Th that's a viable approach. People have stored RDF data in relational databases in this way, but it does have some challenges with it. Yeah, having only one big triple in the database and computing joins with this huge trip t table all the time is um, expensive sometimes and makes it hard for the database management system to optimize um, in some uh, optimizers at least. Um, the advantage, of course, is that now all the different positions are on equal footing and we can write rules even that somehow combine or, or look for K triples where the predicate is the same in as the subject or in another triple and do something with this. So um, then the relationship can be seen with data. Okay, so we always have these two possibilities. We can also combine them somehow, but um, we have to make a decision what we want. <clears throat> okay, now let's uh, maybe also see why this helps us at all. I mean, we already have Sparkle, very powerful query language. So um, is it really true that data log can do anything that Sparkle cannot? And of course the answer should be yes. And this slide here shows you that it is. So example, the following query expresses parallel ST reachability for predicates P and Q. Now, and you remember from my previous video that this was one example of a NL problem that Sparkle cannot express. <clears throat> the goal of finding out whether there's a path with a parallel P and Q edges along every step of the path, but otherwise of arbitrary length uh, that connects S to T. And we can describe that in, in, in RDF, uh, in data log quite easily. Um, we simply say that if there's a triple connecting X with Y along the predicate P and there's another triple connecting X with Y along the predicate Q. Now Q and P are constants in data log, X and Y are variables. Um, if this is the case, then we say X can reach Y. And uh, then we just build a transitive closure over this. We say if X can reach Y and Y can reach Z, then X can reach Z. And in the end, if we find that reach of S comma T is computed in this recursive fashion, then we infer result. Now here, I uh, also for the sake of an example to show you how this looks, I give a result predicate that has no parameters. That's allowed. So in predicate logic, we can have predicates of arity zero. Such predicates can only be true or false. They don't have uh, specific values that they can be true or false for. 
So this is essentially a Boolean query that I have here because the only result it can have is true or false. Um, and we don't want to have specific query results. Um, okay, so this is a, a parallel reachability expressed in three data log rules, uh, even though it wasn't possible to do this in Spark. Many, many other things are also possible. We can have non-regular patterns, so context-free languages are expressible in this. And you can think about a bit how this might work. Maybe we also have some exercises on this. Um, we can have tree-shaped patterns. So it says no restriction here to words along a path, but we can actually integrate from different directions in the graph and uh, do this recursively. And uh, we also can have recursive pattern definitions. For example, um, <clears throat> we could uh, use maybe this reach relationship already to mark certain uh, elements. We could say we are interested in elements that can reach T and then we could use these elements again and look at paths of uh, these elements only. So to speak, uh, to have a uh, way of only having the uh, specific elements that we have selected with this other recursive query in another recursion. So this kind of nested recursions is something that you cannot have in um, uh, a Sparkle because their uh, property paths um, can be nested, but it always will only describe a single path with a nested regular expression, maybe, or I shouldn't say nested regular expression, with a regular expression of a greater nesting level. Um, in terms of the Claney stars, maybe it uses. Yeah. Remember, nested regular expressions were yet another thing that people have studied. Okay, <clears throat> so this is most of what I wanted to say in this uh, short lecture. Let me finish by mentioning the complexity of data log without proof. Uh, remember, for Sparkle, we found that uh, the uh, query answering uh, was p time com p space complete and uh, the uh, data complexities were NL complete. In data log, we have higher complexities, namely X time complete for query complexity and also for combined complexity and P time complete in data. So these are higher both than the P space of Sparkle and the NL of Sparkle data complexity. Yeah, so in this sense, data log is seems to be more expressive, but there are also things that you can do in Sparkle that you cannot do in data log, um, as we will discuss in another part. Okay, so these are the complexities and um, <clears throat> this should of course not uh, make us think that <clears throat> every problem that is polynomially solvable can be solved using data log. I already explained that with the uh, parallel ST reachability for Sparkle, expressivity is not always the same as the complexity. Ex the complexity just means that there are problems that are so difficult, that are uh, expressible, but it doesn't mean that every problem is directly expressible uh, if it is so difficult. And this is the same for data log. Not every polynomial time question that you could have for a graph can be answered with a data log query. And um, well, there's many reasons for this. One obvious reason is data log is monotonic, meaning that the more input facts you have, um, the more results you will derive. This is very intuitive. A rule can be applied to the given data and the more data you give, the more rules you can apply. But uh, adding more data will never make any uh, rules inapplicable in data log. So um, <laughs> more input means more output. But uh, clearly there are polynomial questions that you could ask um, that are not monotonic. For example, if you ask, is there an even number of triples in the database? Count all the triples and tell me whether they are ev the number is even or not. This is not monotonic, why? Well, because if the answer is yes, and I add one more triple, the answer is no longer yes, then it's no. Uh, and if I add one more triple again, it's yes and so on. So um, <clears throat> the uh, number does, the, the answer to this question does not behave in a monotonic fashion and it's therefore not uh, computable in data log, even though it's definitely a problem that is very easy to solve in polynomial time. Yeah? So if I give you a graph, you could find a very efficient algorithm that figures out if the database contains uh, an even number of triples or an odd one. Yeah. Okay, so you see also data log is not the... Uh, end to all uh, uh, quests for more expressivity, but it definitely can do some things 
that Sparkle cannot do. And also it can do things in a different way. So writing such rules in a recursive fashion in some applications may be preferable over writing a very large uh, nested query in Sparkle, even if the expressivity is the same. Um, nevertheless, data log is still pretty limited. And uh, in the next videos, I will discuss some extensions that one can still make to them. In particular, an important uh, extension in data management is negation. We often do want to check if something is not in the database and uh, uh, want to have some form of non-monotonicity by this. And um, I will explain to you uh, then how this can be achieved. Okay, for now, this is all for this video. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.